Thank you, Mr. Spofford, and thank you for your personal story. Thanks to all three witnesses. We'll now begin a round of five-minute questions each. I'll go first, and then Senator Murray. Mr. Spofford, um, Dr. Wynn talked about the, uh, the medicine, naloxone, mm -hmm. that's used when there's an emergency overdose, it sounds like. Take me through the, the process um, uh, at the Granite House. If, if, if suddenly you're introduced to someone who's in, in the midst of an overdose, uh, do you administer naloxone or does someone do that? And I believe you told me earlier that you gradually uh, help people uh, off their addiction within about a week. Is that right? Sure. So what you're referencing is the detox process. Yeah. Understand that opiates as a class of drug has a physical dependency that folks go into withdrawal in the absence of them. Mm -hmm. um, a, a national standard is about a five to seven day process of a taper using a drug such as buprenorphine uh, to bring them back to sobriety. Um, naloxone is not commonly used. It's actually never been used at the Granite House, uh, my facility, because people aren't on drugs and alcohol there. They're, in fact, there achieving sobriety uh, and are sober at that period of time. Mm -hmm. More often or not, we're, we're seeing first responders administering uh, naloxone. We're also seeing it being administered uh, among the addicts. So, so someone who may have administered naloxone and then they bring that person to you uh, later, is that right? Correct, to, to come to treatment. But some people say that a drug like methadone is needed for a long period of time for someone to get over an opiate addiction and some people, and obviously you think it, you prescribe a different sort of treatment. Talk about that. Well, um, methadone and buprenorphine, or the brand name Suboxone, same thing, are replacement drugs, whereas they, are, they themselves are nar narcotics. If I took one right now or anyone in this room did, you'd be high as a kite. You're still maintaining a physical addiction uh, to opiates. It's just taking it from heroin and, and prescription medications bought illegally to a prescription under the oversight of a doctor. I couldn't imagine what my life would look like if I woke up this morning and had to take a pill to not go into withdrawal before I came here to share with you. Mm -hmm. I believe in abstinence-based treatment. The treatment industry is, is very much split down the middle and polarized to two different tides of medication-assisted recovery and abstinence-based, mm -hmm. where my facilities, my own personal program of recovery, and my industry peers believe in that we can be free from all mind-altering substances, and we don't need a crutch such as buprenorphine or methadone over to, to stay away from heroin. Dr. Wynn, what, what's, your, what's your comment on that? Is it necessary to have a, a medicated recovery uh, from an opiate addiction, or is it better not to? First, I wish to say that Mr. Stauffer, uh, Mr. Spoffer's testimony was extremely touching and inspiring. From my standpoint, I have to use evidence and I have to use science because I'm a doctor and a scientist. And when we look at dozens, hundreds of studies that have been done, they show that medication-assisted treatment works. So let me distinguish between the, the two, if I well, may. When do you get to the end of medicated assistant treatment? How long do you have that? Does that go on for the rest of your life? Many patients are maintained on medications for the rest of their life, and I would equate that to high blood pressure or diabetes. I would never say to somebody with high blood pressure, why is it that you're still taking your lisinopril? It's been 30 years. Or say to somebody, why are you still taking your insulin? You've had diabetes for quite a long time. We know that opioid addiction is a chronic disease of the brain, very similar to other physical ailments. And studies have shown that there are most, most individuals would benefit from 
from chronic medication-assisted treatments, and that when somebody is stably maintained on methadone or buprenorphine, that it does not cause them to, quote unquote, have a high. That these certainly can be misused in the same way that oxycodone or any other opioid could be misused, but that somebody could be stably maintained on these medications, and that they will look no different from you and me, they will not be prohibited from operating machinery or driving, and that this is the path to long-term recovery that is evidence-based. Dr. Valak, um, that's a difference of opinion. Uh, I suppose another difference of opinion, one which you referred to, is among physicians and their prescriptions for uh, opiate addiction. Dr. Frieden, for example, the head of Center for Disease Control, had a serious injury that with a lot of pain, and he refused to take oxycodone because he, he, he sees it as a dangerous drug. I know a great many other very well-respected doctors who regularly uh, prescribe oxycodone after a serious back surgery or some other surgery to relieve pain, and it lasts for a few days. Is there a, what did you do about that difference of opinion in Colorado? Uh, thank you, Senator Alexander. We have stressed in Colorado provider education and consensus building around evidence-based practice. So much as Dr. Wen uh, noted, we do the same thing from upstream, from uh, recommending from the very point of diagnosing pain to establishing treatment options to ultimately, if there is pharmacologic treatment of pain, that that might include opioids, but it might include other options that have also been shown to be effective for the treatment of acute or chronic pain. So we, we recommend, as much as the Institute of Medicine has recently uh, recommended that, that the country do, that we view pain uh, much more carefully, all the way from the initial diagnosis and understanding of what the cause of the pain is, what the various treatment options are for the pain, and then to use best available evidence to prescribe. Do you recommend substitutes for oxycodone or other such drugs that are less likely to be addictive? Uh, we view this as a, that there should be options, again, for the provider and for the patient, given the circumstances. Uh, depending on the source of the pain, the type of the pain, I'm not a diagnostician, not being a physician, but as, as a pharmacist, no, understanding the pharmacology and therapeutics of treating pain, there are a variety of options that may range from non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to opioid painkillers to other medications that have pain-relieving properties like gabapentin or some other classes of drugs. So there's a variety of options available, and we believe that physicians are best placed to make those decisions with their patients. Thank you very much, Senator Murray. 